I'll just wait till the recording starts. It was just to um, remind everyone that uh, if you're looking for these recordings, you do have two ways to do it. There's a way that is um, difficult for me to manage, and I don't have 100% control over it. And that way is that within about um, 30 days or maybe 60 days, you can access recordings of our meetings in this Teams chat, and it's a persistent chat. So you can scroll up and access recordings. I think it's for the last 60 days. You can do that all you want. After 60 days, they disappear. <clears throat> now, for some recordings, and apparently not all recordings, and I, I don't, I haven't bothered really, I have tried a little bit and I haven't been successful, maybe I should say it that way, at figuring out why I can control how long some recordings are persistent in Teams and why I can't do that for others. I have stopped short of um, spending time interacting with the IT people on this. I have talked to them in the past about other things related to the recordings. <clears throat> Instead, I've implemented a second way that you can access the recordings that I find easy to manage and that I have 100% control over. Some of you know about it, I think, and that's the fact that for each of these meetings over here, and this stretches back on this particular version of the web page for um, you know, a bit more than a year now, year and a half almost, there is this YouTube link. And for almost all of those, um, you know, up to the meeting from last week, uh, you can just click on that YouTube link and it, it takes you to the, the uh, YouTube account that I call Data Science Garage. I don't know why I named it that, but it's, um, it's just for our Herrig meetings. It only has videos up and a few teaching ones, but it's almost all of the videos on this channel are uh, from the Herrig meetings and uh, you can access them there forever. So I just thought I'd remind everyone of that. Um, it brings us to the schedule. I think if I stop talking pretty quickly that we can get through everything for today's session. Um, now, I'm not so sure about the next session. The last session is for analysis of variance. I really like um, these simple statistics. Uh, I like the methods, I like the philosophy, and I like the coding around them. Um, and these last two sessions are probably relatively important for people, and they're relatively long as well with lots of code, even though they're relatively simple topics. So um, I intend the code here and in the other meetings to be part instructional to help you to think about extracting information from data, but also part um template code you know so that you can adapt it to future problems that you have um what i'm doing is rambling around to say that um, we may need two sessions to get through the last one and i'll endeavor to finish today's session so the schedule may shift a bit if it does not next session will be the last session of the boot camp the normal boot camp someone asked last week if we could cover git and github um and I'm very happy to do a session on that. Some of us use Git every day or most every day. It's becoming more popular for um, non-computer coders to use, and it has been doing that for a long time. It's very mainstream. Uh, I think it probably is very useful to be aware of as a postdoc or a postgraduate student these days in ecology or agriculture or economics or food science. Uh, so it's very relevant for us, too. I know a lot of uh, our colleagues that uh, use it or some of the students use it. So um, I'll go over that next. After that, um, I'm up for some suggestions. I've been working on some graphics projects, so I may um, elect to do one of those. But if you have any ideas for topics you'd like, I'm open for that. I was even thinking we might, uh, we've tried to do it in the past a few times, is read a book together and go through chapters. Um, so maybe we'll do something a little bit different. Our 150th meeting is coming up. It's traditional for every 50 meeting in the past. Um, 
for 50, 100, and now for 150. I've tried to do an in-person meeting and uh, do something fun, so I'll, I'll have to think about that, but you guys think about it too, if there's anything you'd like to do. Um, <clears throat> now, um, for the links today, I've done something a little bit differently with the slides. Uh, I do this very regularly where I re-evaluate the tools that I use. One way that that raises its head is I reinstall the operating system on my computers at least once a year. Mostly I do it more often than that for every computer, reinstall everything. Um, I do that with my teaching materials and other tools I use day to day as well. Um, and I've done it with my slides. So I've made HTML slides this week and they'll look a little bit different. So the topic this week, if you'd like to come along, you can just click the slide and follow along is uh, the t-test or comparing means. This is bootcamp meeting 11. I'm going to try to, uh, if the opportunity arises, to use a new Chrome plugin that I'm, I'm testing, which um, allows me to write on the page with my tablet. So uh, I do like to do that. Let's see if I need to today. And I'm, I may practice a bit more before I go crazy doing that in front of people. We're sort of at the end of um, the boot camp. It's been fun going through it this time. Um, haven't gone through it, I think, so formally before outside of a classroom. Uh, and today we're up to the t-test. Now, a lot of you would have performed a t-test and encountered it before. It, the sort of little quote that I give here is that it's widely considered to be the foundation of statistics. It is one of the basic tests of traditional statistics. It has a long history in statistics. A link to a story about this, um, this dead guy. His name is W.S. Gossett. Uh, he's very famous in the world of statistics, but many people haven't heard of him. Uh, there's another name that's common for the t-test. Uh, Today, we usually just say the t-test, but in past decades, it was almost always referred to as student's t-test. Student was a uh, nom de plume, a pseudonym for this gentleman, W.S. Gossett, William Seeley Gossett. Uh, he published a, an article, a scientific peer-reviewed article, uh, I want to say in the 1920s, but I would have to look at the date. I don't remember the date. And the publishing name he used was student. Um, he was a friend and colleague, but a ju junior uh, to Ronald Island Fisher, R.A. Fisher, the famous R.A. Fisher who invented analysis of variance and um, <clears throat> maximum likelihood and lots of other important tools in statistics and biology. Gossett. Um, worked at the Guinness Brewing Factory. He was a quality control engineer. He was a mathematician by training, and he came up with a method to quantitatively measure elements of quality in Guinness beer, in the Guinness factory. And um, his, his supervisors and colleagues considered his methods so successful that they were a uh, industry secret. But Gossett was a, a very broad thinker, and he realized that the innovation he had done, and he had begun a correspondence with academic statisticians. He recognized himself and through them that he had a, something important that must be shared as a tool to make the world a better place to live in. So in an act of uh, civil disobedience supported by Ronald Island Fisher, he um, he published the um, the method for the t-test in an academic journal, and it in instantly became very popular for uh, scientists and and in industry as well. And it wasn't really specific to Guinness at all, but uh, that's the interesting story of the students' t-test, which I love to tell because it's such a colorful story and all true. And if you visit the uh, Guinness Brewery, the original Guinness Brewery, 
you can see a plaque hanging in the spot where Gossett sat. I've taken my photograph there, although I couldn't conjure the picture for today, unfortunately. Here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about what kind of um, question you ask with the t-test. We're going to talk about the data you need and the assumptions that you make. We'll um, make several graphs that are related to um, graphing a t-test. This is one of my favorite kind of graphs to make, so I'll talk to you a little bit about it. We've already made a few of them. Uh, we'll talk about the test itself, how to perform it in R, and we'll perform a number of t-tests in R today. So you have that template code, no matter what kind of data you have. And we'll talk about alternatives to the t-test if your data don't adhere to the um, assumptions. OK, so now the question of the t-test. Here's an overview, and then we're going to look at each of these um, in turn, and then we'll do some examples uh, before we finish today. The t-test is a very flexible test, and uh, there are a couple of forms of it to keep in mind. Now, one form is where we're just comparing two means where our samples are independent. Now, in, in this form, kind of question we might ask is uh, if we have a control and a treatment where we, uh, we sample two different populations, the control population and the, the treatment population, and we do it for unrelated individuals. It could be plants, it could be cows, it could be humans, it could be something that's uh, geographical. Um, it's a very common application. And usually the case here, when I say two means, is that we've measured something with a quantitative variable, something you can measure, a numeric continuous variable. And we have two um, conditions under which we've measured that continuous variable. And we can think of those two conditions as categories, in which case we can think of them as a factor with exactly two levels. And that's the way that I think about the t-test quite often. There's another uh, version of the t-test. This is probably the least used version, but I, I think for completeness, it's important to mention it. <clears throat> Does come up occasionally, have even help people do them here at Harper, although it is very simple to do on your own. <clears throat> this is where you have um, a known population mean. Maybe it's a gold standard, or maybe it's a past experiment, or maybe it's a control of an experiment you did before, and you merely want to compare another single sample to that known mean. All you need is the mean. Uh, to perform this test, and it, it's called a one sample mean that's compared to a known mean. <clears throat> then the last case, this is equally important to the two independent samples, is where you have two means and uh, your measurements are paired in time. I wonder if I can um, try to, to use my little drawing tool here. <clears throat> Maybe I can um, do something like this and um, open that in a pop-up. See if I can do this. There we go. So um, with a paired t-test, maybe we have um, a measurement before and after. And uh, we're measuring some, some quantitative variable. Uh, in a before and after state. What makes this a paired t-test is that uh, these, these observations are not independent of one another because maybe it's the same individual that you've measured or maybe they're measures in the same place after some time has elapsed. Um, so I will go through an example of this, but uh, this is the difference between um, in this case, a, a paired test and the normal two sample test, in which case you might just have some means that um, are unrelated, completely unrelated to one another. So th this is the difference between these two. Okay. 
<clears throat> now, um, first, we're going to go through this idea of the two means an independent sample, you know, and I, I've already mentioned maybe it's a control group with a treatment group. Maybe it's two different treatments. You're directly comparing them to each other. Um, a special case of this is maybe you have a lot of treatments and you're doing a post hoc test and after the experiment test and you're comparing individual means um, between them. There are special tests to do that, but essentially they're the t-test. Um, we need to talk a little bit about the meaning of independence. I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but when um, we talk about independence, philosophically we're thinking about, let, let's, let's say the example where you have a, a control and a treatment. Philosophically, um, any individual that you could assign to the control group them itself comprises a population. And uh, when we mean independence, we mean that uh, any individual you pick in the control group is completely independent from and unrelated in all ways, practical or otherwise, to individuals you might choose to place in the treatment group for an experiment. Or we mean independence uh, if you're measuring um, characteristics of fields or sites uh, on the earth that uh, the the places you pick are independent with one another um, with respect to distance, geographical location. So there's no uh, systematic relationship between them. That's a philosophical idea. We We could do a whole lecture easily on the notion of independence and what it means for sampling. For sampling, um, for these two independent samples, it means that any individual assigned to either group could have the opportunity to be in either group if it's an experiment or you're imposing a treatment, uh, or that there is randomness in the um, the assignment of um, of your sample. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we're going to do some coding going to go to the R Bootcamp page, and uh, I think we have a, a first section where we go through a little bit of, a, of, a, uh, of an example. Okay, I'm going to make a new script. But just like usual, we'll just set up our um, script with a header. <clears throat> We're going to go to, um, in this case, section <clears throat> 2.1. We paste our code. Now, uh, what this says here, if you go back through it, is we're just going to um, create some data to work with. And I've given you the data vectors uh, here. In, in this case, it's um, let's see if I describe the um, the data. We're we're going to create some data that are uh, representing the the means of a numerical variable for two different samples. Um, and this is just the typical design where we've got one control and one creep um, treatment group. In this case. Um, Maybe uh, the levels have to do with density of something where we've taken our samples from, and we've got a high density sample and a, a low density sample, and then we're measuring the height. Now, I think that the the story associated with this is it was um, trees or plants or something like that. I'm just going to I've already copied that. So what we're going to do is we're going to pop up in the um, global environment. I'm just going to make this a bit bigger. Let's get ourselves sorted out here. And up in the global environment now, oh, and I'm going to turn off my co-pilot so it doesn't disturb me. So I go fast enough without co-pilot most days. OK, so let's make our density variable. It'll pop up up in the global environment. Three, two, one. What I've done here is I've used the combine function and I've replicated just the character string high seven times 
and then I've replicated the character string low seven times. So if we look in what's in the density, just look down in the console three, two, one. We've just got seven of each of those. So I've, I've wrapped the replicate function in the combined function to make a vector 14 character strings long. Then I'm going to, um, I've got this data set aside for height, three, two, one. We'll just look at the height data, three, two, one. There we go. So our heights are associated with high and low. And then I'm going to turn them into a data frame by wrapping these two vectors uh, into the data frame column. And I'm going to call this long data. What do I mean by long data? I'll tell you in a moment. Three, two, one prints. Now, <clears throat> with the t-test and with some other common statistics, we have uh, what are described as data in a long format and data in a wide format. So data in a long format is uh, for a t-test. It's data where we've got the one variable we've measured, and we've got every measure of that variable um, in its own column. And then remember the way that I said I think of t-tests <clears throat> is that we have a factor with exactly two levels. Well, in the long format, that's explicit. So we have a factor uh, column here called density, and the levels are um, high and low uh, for it, and there are 14 values. Now, a wide format for the same data, I may have an example of it. I may be getting ahead of myself, but I'll just say it verbally for your benefit here, is that uh, we would have two columns, one for um, low height and one for high height. And each of those two columns would have the continuous variables, and we wouldn't have any column at all for the uh, for the continuous variable. Now, I hope that sounds trivial to you when I say that. It's just two different ways you could represent the same data. But um, when we get to more complicated statistical models, thinking about the format of your data in terms of long and wide is very, very useful. And for most computer programs that do data analysis, for almost all of them these days, the long format is the preferred format. And that goes for, you know, SPSS and GenStat as well. Although all of them will handle both formats, it might take you a little extra work. Okay, so we've got our data object. Now we could get rid of density and height in our global environment. I'm not going to do that just yet. Um, I do have an example for the wide format. <clears throat> and uh, I just do that. Uh, now here I've made a, a different data frame. Here I'm calling it wide data. And uh, here, just as I verbally said, I've made a using the data frame function. And in that I'm wrapping a phrase called uh, high height or high density and the height Thing we've measured and I've, I'm, I'm passing to it a combined vector of just these first seven values that, that correspond to the high um, data and then likewise a low dot height so let's do that it'll pop up up in the global environment three two one there it is and let's um, just see what that has, looks like three two one so we can see it I did already print it out because I wrapped the expression in an extra pair of um, round braces. OK, so <clears throat> this is that wide format that I was mentioning. Now, if we eyeball this, look at these um, values. We can kind of see that in the high density height measures, we can eyeball that the values tend to be lower than the values in the low density height column. So I'm already thinking about how to analyze this data and what we might find if we do. So the very first thing, I um, haven't maybe emphasized this before, but the uh, very first thing that I do when I read in data before any statistical test is I'll graph it. You should as well, because it, it reinforces um, uh, the assumptions that you make and the methods that you use for any analysis. Now, if I scroll down a little bit, we're going to create a a plot that looks very like this one. This is a box plot. I explained 
last time that uh, it's named for the statistician that described it, George Box, and the meaning of the elements of the graphic are important. Um, the box uh, hinges, as they're referred to, are the middle 50% of the data. So the 25% quartile and the 75% quartile bounds. And the whiskers, so-called, are the range of the data, unless there are values that are outside the 95% confidence interval, in which case the whiskers denote the 95% confidence interval. In this case, there are no outliers. So these are the ranges of the data. And the dark middle line is, uh, it's not the mean. Some people might assume it's the mean logically, but it's the median, it's the center value. And altogether, um, this gives us quite a lot of information about the, uh, um, the distribution of the data in, at just a glance. Um, here, I've also, and this is something I do as a rule, I like to draw on the raw data as well so that we can see the exact data points. Sometimes that's very useful, although it is, some people would argue, redundant to the box plot. Uh, I still find it useful to draw them on almost all the time. So this is code we can do to um, create this graph, and I'll just walk you through it. Uh, now, um, have a little note here. The note says that um, <clears throat> that we're going to um, create a box plot <clears throat> and um, going to use the box plot function. And we're measuring, no, th this is an example of an R formula. We talked about that last week. And we read this as uh, height as a function of density. And uh, by convention, the variable on the left is uh, the variable that will be on the y-axis, the dependent variable by convention, and the variable that we name here on the on the right is the x-axis variable or the independent variable. So here we're implying by setting up our function this way, our um, our R formula phrase, that we are investigating whether density has an influence on height. Um, we're using just the names of the variables, and then in the data argument, we're specifying we're going to use the long data data object up here, and we're giving it a title, um, main, two independent samples. Let's make it three, two, one. There it is. Sometimes box plots, and this one's no exception, um, look better when the um, box that you draw them in is square. So I. I like to endeavor when it when I can, especially for a small number of boxes to have a square palette for figures like this. It's a per personal preference. It's efficient, but it also draw it focuses the attention on differences. This is a huge difference, but for smaller differences, it's uh, just an element of design. What I also like to do then is to um, draw the dots on. And this next part is a little more complicated and it's optional. But um, what we need to do, if we were to just draw the dots on here, they would be in a straight line if we set them at the locations where high and low are. But we want to jitter them a little bit so that they spread out and we can see them more. This is a standard technique for making the kind of graph. And the jittering is random and should be random. But if we want to make the same graph over and over, we need to do what's called set a seed. I cannot remember if we have talked about this before. For now, in the interest of time, let's just say that if you put any number in here, you'll be able to make the graph over and over again. And the amount of spread by jitter that we place on the uh, data will be exactly the same. I'm going to draw them red. I'm going to make them that circle that is solid that I like. And I'm going to adjust the size just a little bit. What's going on up here? I'm using the points function, setting the x variable. That's the variable that will make coordinates on this x axis. I'm just passing ones and twos because the way that um, 
box plots work is uh, for each category you have, the first location is numerically one, and the second one is two, and so on. With the jitter function, um, we're adding a little bit of random variation to that, so that if I just pass the the uh, the numbers as I enter them, it's just ones and twos. But I ask the jit if I pass that to the jitter function and add a small amount. Here I'm adding 0.2 to the amount and pass that 3, 2, 1. You can see that a random small amount has been added to each of these. Now check this out. I think what will happen if I do this over and over again a few times, notice how each time I do this, I get a slightly different number because it's randomized. That's jitter. It just does random um, stuff. Well, if I execute this set seed, turns out that in, in computer, I've, I said I wasn't going to explain this, and here I am explaining it anyway, digressing as usual. Turns out that computers, it's a it's a real hard problem to actually do something actually random, uh, and computers cannot do that yet. There are lots of ideas about how we might do that in the future. But uh, all computers, all computers, to my knowledge, cannot do that. And instead, they, they do something that is called uh, pseudo-random. Now, pseudo-random is just like random, except it's not really random. You have to have a starting point to seed a random sequence of numbers that you generate. And that's what jitter, or that's what set.seed does. So we can pick any, any number we wish. Um, if I were to draw the points on the plot, just keep your eye on the plot and I'll make some random plots and you'll see them move around in different places. Three, two, one, boom, boom, boom. I have to draw the, uh, the plot over and over again. It kept drawing those on top of each other, but you could see that it was drawing dots in different places every time. So let's make a new box plot, three, two, one. And this time, I'm going to include that set seed and I'll I'll execute this three times. Three, two, one, boop, two, three. Now it did draw three sets of dots, but it drew them in the exact same locations because now we included the set seed. Okay. So this is the way that I like to draw a box plot. It has um for it's a continuous variable. Uh this is this seems controversial sometimes to people when I say it to them, but it's entirely inappropriate. It's widely considered inappropriate to uh, create bar graphs when you have a continuous variable. In some fields, it's still very common to do that, but it's considered bad practice. Instead, because this is a continuous variable, we would use the box plot, that's best practice, or a dot within a measure of the uh, the spread. And I like the box plot way of doing it with the explicit data on there. I think I've explained all that. Now, is there anything else to do? No, we're back to the slides for just a moment now. Now, another form of this t-test is the um, where we compare one mean to a known population mean. Now, maybe this is a um, a uh, treatment group and you have the mean of some past data you know or maybe maybe it's some kind of new circumstance a, a new treatment a new drug a new um, way to treat a crop when it goes in or you know anything that you can measure like that and you're comparing it to a known gold standard let's say like a very if it was some kind of crop treatment or method, maybe you're comparing it to a, a known maximum yield or a known favorable yield. It says the same um, notion of independence for this, but it, here it only applies to the one treatment group. You need random um, random allocation to a to a treatment group. We also have the same constraint for our um, sampling considerations of randomness. Again, it only applies to the treatment group. Okay, so we're going back to code. <clears throat> so um, 
here we are going to um, look at some data. Just make this um, a little smaller temporarily so we can see a bit more of the code. Um, now here I've come up with uh, some data. I cannot remember if I have contrived a, um, a a story with this data. Let's say it's a sample of um, <clears throat> of um, you know tons of of uh, wheat yield per hectare or something. I think that's close to a, a pretty good yield for um, hectare in a wheat field. Okay, so here. Um, we're just going to create our sample. I'm going to make this a little bit smaller so we can see it pop up in the global environment. Three, two, one. We can just test that it came through. Three, two, one down on the console. There we go. And um, here we're going to make a box plot. Now this time, because there's only one vector, we're just passing the variable itself and it's going to just make a single box plot. Okay, three, two, one. I've made a long title. And because of my magnification on my computer, um, it has gone off. And th this is wholly unacceptable, unacceptable. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, insert a special character, a backslash and an in. The backslash is to let the computer parser know that uh, the character right after it is not really text, that it's a special character that means new line. So let me just demonstrate what it means. Three, two, one. There we go. It's in. It's introduced a hard stop on the new line character, and that backslash tells it that that in is is a special character. It's not just another character in my text string. All right. So uh, as you know, I like to put in my um, my raw data points. I've I've made it. I call it mere vanity in that comment because I've made it red and I've. You know, I've made the the circle character that I just prefer. I just like it. It's comforting to me. I've, I've adjusted the size. We don't need to do any of that, but it looks good. And a lot of times, if you're communicating your data to other people, um, if you take a little care to make it look really good, it will have a much bigger impact, a much bigger impact than just the default graph. Here it comes the points, three, two, one. Now, a thing I like to do on a lot of graphs like this is um, because the box plot by default has the uh, has the median line. Uh, if the median, if your data sample is exactly perfectly Gaussian to the bell-shaped curve, if your sample is perfectly Gaussian, then the median will be exactly the same as the mean. If your sample is perfectly Gaussian, the median will be exactly the same as the mean. Of course, we know samples are not perfect ever. And so um, what I like to do sometimes, especially if we're asking a question about differences in means, is I like to draw the exact mean onto the graph. And that's what we're doing here. I'm using this AB line function. Now that that literally just draws, draws a line between A and B. And one of the arguments is H for horizontal. And I'm going to draw it at the mean for my sample. I say it's 2.0, but you know what I could do? Uh, oh, well, this 2.0, the reason I say it's 2.0 is because that's our, for our one sample, that's our gold standard we're comparing it to. So there's a reason I've drawn it at exactly two. That's our gold standard for this example. So I'm going to make a, a blue dashed line that's a little thick. Three, two, one. Oops, I think is because I selected that. Three, two, one. There we go. Now look at that. Um, it looks like our sample is a little lower on average. The, the trend is a little skewed towards lower values than our gold standard of 2.0. Let's see what the web page has to say about that. So that does indeed look like that. And uh, we're, you know, we're asking the question. We're just we haven't actually done the statistic yet, but uh, is it different from the dashed line? Okay, that's the question we're asking. 
All right, what do I have on my slide for the paired samples? <clears throat> paired samples. Now this is that special kind of um, repeated measures sort of um, sample. I mean, maybe it's one kind of feed for individual cows and then another kind of feed at another time. Or maybe it's a, um, a treatment or a, or a population of um, animals that the vet gives or humans that the vet gives where they take a measure before and after a treatment, after time has elapsed. So that's the commonest reason to use paired samples. There are some other reasons. It doesn't have to be a person or an animal. It could be individual plants. It could be sites um, in a field or in a habitat. <clears throat> Often it's a baseline compared to some some treatment or some intervention that you do. Okay, and we have exactly the same independence and sampling considerations here. So we're just going to look at a little um, example of this. <clears throat> now, um, plotting paired samples is a little involved. This is a biochar example where we've gone out. Do you guys know what biochar is? I, I know some of you do. Biochar is a, um, a slightly burned vegetation matter that, that locks in, makes the nutrients in vegetative material um, inaccessible, or at least less accessible than raw material. And an idea with bi biochar is that you could put it out and it would slowly release those nutrients into the ground, but it would take some time. So... <clears throat> Let's, looks like we're just making the data to start with. <clears throat> so uh, here I've used this um, relatively complicated code. You don't have to worry about it too much. But uh, in essence, I'm creating a data structure that has plot, and the plots are um, a number of letters. And we have a first measure and a second measure. And I'm converting that to a data frame that doesn't have any row names. Um, you don't have to worry about the details of this. I'm just going to submit that, and it's going to pop up over here, 321. It's just another variable. This structure, by the way, <clears throat> is a way for you to share programmatically your data frames so that anybody could replicate an example. So that's why I've gone to that extreme with it. This is a real data set, um, a little part of a real data set that I've worked on before. This is what the data frame looks like. So we've got uh, plots and um, I think these are nitrogen measures. I don't I can, don't remember the units. I may specify that on the web page, can't remember. Okay, let's see what else we got. So now we're gonna we're gonna plot these now. The way to plot this kind of variable, I, I drew it before. Let me just draw it again. Is uh, we often have a you know time A and a time B, and uh, we're measuring something at these times, and uh, then we have a second time where we measure them, and uh, they're connected in some way because these these dots that I'm drawing the lines between are maybe the same site where we've measured nitrogen or the same individual cow that we fed two different feeds. What we're looking for here visually is uh, the traditional way to do this is to draw some sort of line between the paired measures. And we're looking for um, whether or not all of those, those lines go in the same direction. And uh, as an aside, we won't cover this in, in this boot camp, but if you hear of an interaction effect um, versus a main effect, if you've ever heard language like that, this is a kind of diagnostic plot where we specifically also can look for interaction effects. So if there's an effect of the treatment, A and B, we would expect all the lines to go up mostly or down mostly. We're looking for that. If there's no interaction effect, all of the lines will be parallel. But if there is an interaction effect where some, some of our observations um, behave differently 
than others with respect to A and B, then a lot of those lines might be crossed. Maybe rather more of them would be crossed than I've drawn here. Okay, so that's just a, a way to think about it. So let's let's draw that graph. <clears throat> now I have a little pet peeve that that goes to R code, and I've never solved it myself, so I I don't have anything really to complain about. I could solve this myself. Uh, as a matter of fact, this code that I've written here is my own solution. And I, I could give share this solution with other people in an R package or something. There are really are not there is not a good easy way to make that stereotypical paired t test plot. There is one called an interaction plot that uh, I have used with some of you who are in the call here <laughs> before, but uh, this is a way to make one from scratch. It's not totally horrendous, but it's also not totally easy either. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm plotting my um, my variables, just a regular old plot, and I'm jittering my ones and twos like I did before with a little bit of an amount. And then y is going to be um, <clears throat> my first and second biochar measurements. Okay. Then I'm doing some other things like putting titles on it and adding some color, but uh, let me make the plot and let's have a look at it. Three, two, one. All I've really done here, as you can see, is I've, I've made the one and the two locations, and then I've made the measures for the two nitrogens before and after. Now, if I wanted to make them, if I, if I select this plot and I make it a number of times, look subtly, how the plot will change and you'll see the randomness in the jitter three two one every time i do it, it it changes a little bit and if i change this amount of jitter um you know maybe i'll change this to point one or something like that and let's just see how the jitter amount changes at three two one you can see that it changes it a little bit if i wanted that to be exact i would also put a set seed up here To put any value in there, and then I can make this every time, and it doesn't change. Okay, so I'm going to put um, some text over here. Three, two, one. This is just text at side one is the bottom side, and I'm putting it at location one and location two, and I'm just doing this to label, put my own labels on this plot. <clears throat> The line one is there's some imaginary lines where my cursor is here and where my where the letters printed is line one. And you can print a line 0.5, line 1.5. You know, it's just an aesthetic thing. Now, though, comes the tricky part is we're going to add some lines that connect each of the cases to one another. I'm just going to make the lines first and we can look at them. And then I'll explain this code. Three, two, one. So I've just drawn those light little lines. Remember what we're doing is we're looking in a paired t-test for all the lines going in the same direction. They more or less do, and most of them don't cross each other. So it does look like there's a strong effect here. Now, what have I done here? I've used something called a for loop. We haven't gone over this yet, yet and I'm not going to go over it, um, but it's just, I think I did do one of them where I explained it's just a uh, tool where you want to do something multiple times that's repetitive. And here, what we're doing is I've got one for loop for each of these lines. Uh, well, there's one for loop, but um, the number of times it is doing it is 1 to 15, corresponding to 1 to 15 lines that I would like drawn. <clears throat> Notice how I've drawn them at a certain place. My, my jittered dots are at one or two plus or minus a small amount. And I've drawn the lines between where I think my dots will be. So the lines will be between 1.05 and 1.95. So you can see they, they stop just short of going all the way to the dots, just for aesthetic reasons. And then the y variables are the pairs 
of biochar in dot first and in dot second, and then a little bit of aesthetics. So that's what's going on here. This is the traditional plot for a paired t test. Okay, now you could adapt this code to any any kind of um, code that you have, data that you have in the future. Data and assumptions. Well, we make a few assumptions here. We make the assumption of the Gaussian, and this is an important part. We make the assumption of the Gaussian within each sample. I'll demonstrate why that's important in a second. We also make the assumption of heteroscedasticity, our old friend, the equality of variance. Now, this is a formal assumption. It turns out with the t-test that um, we can account for it statistically if our data are different in variance between two samples. They often are. So the modern way to do the t-test, we don't have to worry about heteroscedasticity, but formally that is one of the assumptions. And it's just that by default, we account for it usually. So I'll mention it out of a formality. We also make that assumption of the independence of observations and you know, all of the stuff that is fun to think about, the philosophy of sampling and, um, and, and, and independence. Now, um, <clears throat> one of the things I want to emphasize is that this assumption of the Gaussian, it, um, it's often incorrectly assumed that this is all of your samples for both of the uh, conditions for a t-test, but that's incorrect. I'll demonstrate that uh, very clearly in a second, I hope. Um, but instead, we assume that each sample separately adheres to the Gaussian. Um, and another thing I wanted to mention is that we, we looked at testing residuals last time, and we tested that assumption of Gaussian distribution of residuals. Well, when we test each sample here, it's it's analogous to testing whether the residuals are are Gaussian for regression. Okay, so he, here is just graphically why it doesn't make any sense for us to assume the Gaussian for two different samples. Here's something where we've measured height in uh, in humans, and we've got uh, males and females. Males and humans are taller in um, in most populations. And uh, if we tested whether the sample of all of the subjects that we measured were um, Gaussian, it doesn't make any sense because there are two different distributions that come from two different populations. Uh, here, we've got a lot going on in this graph, but the blue line is the mean measurement for males. The red line is the mean measurement height for females. Um, these are real data um, from students. The green line would be the ex, uh, expected Gaussian distribution for data if all of the subjects came from the same population. You can see that the data are very different to that. They're bimodal, as you would expect. And the black line is the grand mean. So it's right in the middle of the expected Gaussian. Let's just look at the code to make that data. I'm going to go a little quick for this because it's just kind of a <clears throat> Just putting a, a point on it. As a matter of fact, because we're so close to the time, I'm, I'm not going to go to the code for this, um, but I will do the code for the, the next graph. So um, this is the smart way to test whether our data are Gaussian. This is called a stacked um, histogram plot. So if we have different categories, we stack them. So I will go through the code for this because um, this is kind of diagnostic graph that we might use all the time. I'm just going to go down to the um, to the um, uh, stacked bar plot code. Okay, for this one, um, because it's stacked, I'm going to make the pane much taller. Uh, here I am, we have looked at this before, I'm setting the parameter function and the MF row argument to have two rows and one column. 
So I'm going to make have one row with one histogram and a second row on the same pane with the second histogram. So three, two, one, that won't do anything. That's just setting that parameter. Now I'm going to make the first histogram, three, two, one. What have I done? I think um, what I have done is I haven't made the data in this previous um, in this previous one. So let me grab the the data there. Copy. Just make the data up here. So I'm just randomizing. So this is not uh, real data. Misremembered. I have done this experiment in classes before, but um, <clears throat> not this time. I didn't bring it in this time. Somewhere here, I've also turned that into a data set. There we go. Grab both of those and explain that briefly. On line 102, I'm just converting height and sex to a data frame that I'm calling data. And in line um, 103, I'm using the RM function for remove, to remove those individual data points, height and uh, sex that I don't need anymore. So you can watch them disappear, three, two, one. That's just cleaning our memory really to free it up. Just best practice to do that every once in a while if you don't need those variables ever again. Okay, now let's make that histogram, three, two, one. There we go. All I've done here is I've done a histogram slicing out the rows that correspond to M for male. And next, I'm going to make that theoretical curve. We have gone through this again, so I'm just going to do it quickly. Three, two, one. You can play with this yourself. So I'm just drawing a little curve in there. I'm going to do exactly the same thing for females now. Three, two, one. This is a nice graphical way to do it. And I like this stacked bar plot way of doing it because it allows us to view both of our variables on the same scale gives us a lot of information. This is just exploring the data. OK. Now, um, a lot of people want to have a formal test of whether or not your data are Gaussian. I think I promised one for this week, and the one that I like to use, there are a number of them, and I've used a number of them over the years, but the default one is the Shapiro test, Shapiro.test. So the way we access that, is um, <clears throat> if we were looking at our um, data, this is the wrong way to do it. Wrong Shapiro. This is the wrong way to do it. And I'm just going to do this quickly because um, we haven't distinguished between males and females. So this is testing the um, the assumption for this graph. And uh, we know that this data does not look very Gaussian. So if it doesn't look Gaussian, we should get a p-value that's very small on this Shapiro test. So uh, three, two, one. And indeed, this p-value being very small indicates that our data are significantly different to Gaussian. And I'm, I'm not going to go through the all of the code on the website. I'll let you guys do that on your own. But just to show you what it might look like if we did males or females um, by themselves, I'll just slice out the data for females first. Three, two, one, not different to Gaussian. And if I just change that to M for males, and this also not different to Gaussian, um, this is the appropriate way to test that assumption if you have data you're concerned about. Okay, we've done that. We've done that. Um, and now we're just going to do the t tests. And I'm going to hurry <laughs> because we're almost out of time. And I'm going to go to the um, website. Now, the first one we're going to do is the uh, two sample t test. It's going to grab all of that. So um, <clears throat> just make sure that I 
Got that. Boom, copied. Undo that. And then paste that. So I've got a lot um, going on here. Um, I'm going to set the. Let's see, I've already done that one. Draw the female cyst. I have already done that one. Why is that not copying? I'm just going to copy this. Ah, so I'm in the wrong place. Getting ahead of myself. There we go. Two sample teeth tests. There we go. Undo on that. Undo. There we go. <clears throat> Thought that looked like too much code. So it's it's quite straightforward to do this this last little bit. <clears throat> the first thing we're doing is um, creating some some data on tree density. So similar to the data before, if not the same. So we're making a density variable, height variable, and making a tree growth data frame. Just make that three, two, one. Print it out with the data frame. It looks like that. We're going to do a T test comparing height for the high and low frequency. I mean uh, density. <clears throat> I'm not going to load the library for car for the QQ plot. We've done that before. And I'm not going to uh, do the histogram. I'm just going to go straight to the statistical test. And uh, it's quite straightforward. This is it. I just make that a little bit bigger. We've got the t-test. Here we're using our formula where we're measuring height as a function of density and our data are tree growth. Let's go ahead and submit that. Three, two, one. Now, um, when we report statistics, we need three things always. We need the test stat. We need the degrees of freedom or the sample size, and we need the p-value. Every statistical test, this is the golden rule. You report it like that. And for here, the, um, the test statistic, this is notated differently for every test. But for the t-test, it's uh, the t-statistic. So uh, here, um, this is a, a measure of how different our two means are. It'll be negative if the second mean is smaller than the first, like it is in our data set, uh, or positive. So it it we can think of the magnitude of this, the absolute value of the magnitude of this is a measure of the bigness of the difference, independent of which one is the biggest mean. The degrees of freedom is um, <clears throat> is our sample size for a two sample t test minus two. So um, our our sample size here is not uh, perfect uh, perfect in terms of how we normally calculate degrees of freedom. And the reason for that is that there's a weighting added by default to all t tests. I mentioned it before when the variances are not exactly equal. And in samples, they almost never are. So we would report this rounded probably to just one decimal value. And then the p-value, in this case, it's very small. Now, when we report these, we um, we put them in a format that is the simplest to understand, retaining all of the relevant information. So we might report this as a t-test, T equals negative. <clears throat> Here I'm going to just round it negative 8.63. Um, degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom here are 11. Point, let's just do two decimal degrees of accuracy for consistency 11.687. Uh, and the p value here, because it's very small. Um, we're going to report this as p less than 0 0.01. If your p-value is um, is higher than 0 0.0001, report the exact p-value in decimal format, never in scientific notation. Let's see how close I came to how I advised reporting it. So, um, you know, here 
the way you would report this is we detected a significant difference between mean height for tree growth at higher load density two sample t test t blah df blah p value so this is how we report it let's do this for the one sample t test quickly here um, this is also riffing on um, a PhD student here at Harper who's studying earwigs. Um, I think this is maybe the size of, uh, of earwigs in millimeters or something. Hayden, I haven't seen Hayden in these meetings in a while, but I think he's doing okay. So here, earwig size, three, two, one. Um, and now here, this is a one sample t-test. So we are going to um, compare our sample to a known mean value. Here it's 17.0321. I'm putting in a value called my mu. Mu is the um, traditional scientific notation for the for the uh, the symbol for the mean, the sample mean. Here, all we do is we uh, use the t-test, setting the x variable to our one sample, uh, and then setting mu to your value of mu. So three, two, one. Here. There is not a difference between our sample and the um, and the gold standard because our p is above 0.05. Just kind of look back at how I um, recommend reporting that. I've got a template for a lot of them like this, but the pattern is always the same: the uh, test statistic, degrees of freedom, and the p-value. The last one we'll do is some paired samples. Here, um, I can't remember the story, but it's uh, measuring, it looks like uh, cortisol in pregnant cows, okay. And uh, it looks like um, um, they were measuring stress here, and there was a baseline measure and then a, a treatment where soothing music was played to the cow. So we expect the cortisol to, uh, to decrease in, in the sample if that treatment worked. Okay, so three, two, one. This is just wide format. And our t-test here, we, we've got an x and a y, so this is just wide format, each variable in its own um, x or y argument. And here we're setting the uh, paired um, argument. By default, it's set to false. Here we're just setting that to true, three, two, one. And here, um, there actually was an effect of soothing music being played. Uh, the T statistic, 3.73, negative 3.73, degrees of freedom 19, P value equal to 0 0.001. Now let's just see if that's all the slides. I'm pretty sure that it is. We've done the one sample T test. We've done the paired T test. Oh yes, the Wilcox test. I will mention this because it's um, it's important. So if your assumptions don't hold, if you've measured something like counts, we don't expect count values to be Gaussian. Um, one option, a good option, is um, a non -para, so called non parametric test that doesn't make the assumption of Gaussian. It ranks all your variables and asks, are the rankings different in quantity? Now this is a bit confusing because the same exact test is uh, goes by two different names. Most people, um, there's a typo on this slide. Most people um, in ecology would have grown up knowing this test as the Mann-Whitney U test. I've missed out the U on Mann-Whitney, but it was actually discovered concurrently by two different researchers. Uh, it was also discovered by Wilcoxon, who was a statistician, and um, the other man, Whitney, man and Whitney uh, worked with ecologists, and it was reported in the ecological literature at the same exact time, unbeknownst to each other. Uh, but in R, it's implemented as the Wilcox test, but it is the same test. So let's just uh, do that. I don't know why it's the Wilcox test. It's weird because it um, the name of the person that discovered it was Wilcoxon, and it's called the Wilcoxon test but it does appear in general use as either Wilcoxon or Wilcox. So it's very confusing, the naming of this test. 
but it is important and you will come across it and need to use it sometimes. All right, so um, let's come down and try this. We'll just grab that. I'll show you how easy it is. Right, just have a look at the data. We're gonna make some date, um, some, um, I think this is for uh, chicken diets, diet and diet bone, two different diets for chickens, library cars and, and hist for diet. I haven't turned my parameters back, so we'll just get a funny small graph up here. Now this may or may not be Gaussian um, because we have our, our two values and they're, they're, um, <clears throat> they're different. Let's try the diet.bone one. There we go. We can see that the diet.bone one especially is very skewed, definitely not Gaussian. So this would be good to compare these with the um, Wilcoxon test. Notice that the scales are not the same either. So the uh, does indeed seem that the plain old diet is, has smaller values than the larger diet of bone. So let's go ahead and grab the uh, code for, um, skip the QQ plots and just grab this code for the Wilcox test. <clears throat> Set our parameters back, but we've already don't really need to do that at this point. So here, all we're doing is setting the X and the Y. Works very similar and is interpreted very similarly to the t-test. Um, here, we do not get a degrees of freedom, but instead we would report the um, the uh, sample size. So diet and diet bone each have 15 observations. Um, so we might report that the N was 30 or the N was 15 per sample. Um, and the W test statistic, again, the bigness of it on an arbitrary scale represents how different your samples are. And here we're looking at the p-value again, and the samples are different on average. So let's look at how we might report that. Um, I think I have a uh, graphed it, and I've reported it here. So we found evidence of a difference in the number of eggs laying under control diet and a diet supplemented with bone meal. So this was counts of eggs. So we wouldn't expect the count to be continuous. And that was a Mann-Whitney U test, my preference, because I grew up learning about the Mann-Whitney U test, not the Wilcoxon test. And it's W equals 63.5, N equals 15 and 15, P equals 0 0.037. Okay, we, We've gone quite a bit over. That's all I have to say. So I'm finally finished. Thank you for staying. That was very, um, very uh, nice of everyone. I'm going to stop recording.